Pastor Kenny, Pastor Dave, uh, it's our second week together. Wow, it right. has gone by very slowly, has it not? Uh, it's good to be with you. I, I think we're adding one more person to our panel today, yep. and that is uh, Miss Megan Brown. Uh, she is uh, with a pair of church organization, and she's going to come talk to us and discuss with us a little bit about pair church. And, the, and our virtual thoughts for today. Right. Uh, Pastor, you were in Romans, not Romans, Revelation chapter 1, I believe the right. emphasis was on 13 through 20. It was. Can you recap for us just a few minutes what, what, what was said? Sure. Uh, and first of all, we did a kind of a biblical survey of the, the ecclesia, the people of God gathered together. And then to make the real point and to put everything together, so as they say, looking at John on the Isle of Patmos and how that in the Lord's Day, and we talked about how that Sunday became the Lord's Day because it was the day the Lord was resurrected on. It was the day the church began to celebrate his resurrection. And uh, so they, they parted from the Old Covenant community and the Sabbath. So in the Lord's Day, John is there and, and uh, apparently he's in isolation and he's in the Spirit. And we just talked about how that in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, and how that matches up with the, the people of God because his thoughts are directed by Christ to the seven churches uh, during that. And so the, the idea was just, you know, John's love for the church. He's there because of his testimony for, for Christ and being a part of the church. And uh, so that's how, that's how we used or, or came to that passage. Okay. Pastor Dave, you gave the children's sermon, I, I believe, during that time. Yeah. And you were emphasizing that. Uh, Kind of bring it in, small, couple sentences. All right. All right. Yes, we just emphasize the ecclesia, the called out ones, and how we're called out by God, by His Spirit, to be a people, to be one, to be together, and all the different things there in early Acts that they were doing together, and that emphasis of together, being a body. But also then how we go and share that gospel by the power of the Spirit, so that He calls out others to come and be a part of that body with us. So we're one, but reaching out to others to come and join us. Okay. Now, when we were, we're doing this sermon and, and we're enjoying it at home, there have been some questions uh, I, I noticed about, uh, are we doing right by doing this? Are we, uh, by following the government guidelines as a body of believers, is this right? Pastor, would you... You know, I, I think that is a great question. I think it is right. And I think it's right for two reasons. First of all, we, we are protecting the membership here from not persecution. We're not going underground or secret church, but from a disease that can be very bad, especially for older people and people with health problems. But another thing we're doing, I thought about this, is we're not only protecting this group, we're protecting the community. Because when we come together and, and we're not sharing this disease and then going out and sharing it with other people, I, I think it's a good thing. And I think for now, it's the right thing. Okay. For now, I think it's the right I, thing. I, I want to hold on to that now. Past, pa <laughs> Pastor Dave, can you give me a little on that? I was thinking that too, that for now, because as it's progressed a little bit, it was an interesting situation made me think about it. And say, how, okay, how far do we go with it? And how far can the government go in limiting the church as well because one of the things that was brought out in Georgia this week was they were asking, didn't put out a, a law or rule right now, but asking churches not to do the drive-in church because some of them were doing the drive-in churches, coming to parking lot in their cars and, and they were asked not even to do that. Thinking. And so that got into me, for me more the question of, okay, if we're following the guidelines but still gathering together in some sense, do we do that? You know, we had even talked about possibly doing the drive-in thing for Easter. Hmm. Okay. And thought about using FM transmitter and just, we got everybody here, transmit it, turn on your radios in your cars, hear the sermon. Like you a drive-in movie. Yeah, just yeah, like the okay. drive-in movie thing instead of hanging the thing on your window. You now, know. The Z generation <laughs> is listening to us. Yeah. Don't, don't understand that. that. But I understood. <laughs> I was thinking they, they, may <laughs> they may be back soon. They may be back soon. The drive-in theater may be back. That's true. We may. We may. That's you right. may have all these movies, uh -huh. <laughs> you know, studios wanting drive-in theaters again. That's true. That's true. <laughs> but 
Can, we have to think about, all right, it, does there come a point where the government tries to limit, but it starts hindering us from being the church? Oh, okay. And then we've got a whole other conversation okay. to discuss. I, I, I'm going to ask you to hold <laughs> that one, and I'm going to go back to you, Pastor, uh, Pastor Ken, uh, for now. You said for now. Explain a little deeper into for now. I think for now it's, it's appropriate, and I think for times such as this, okay. I think providentially blessed to have this meeting and to be able to reach people in their homes. I mean, they're isolated in their homes. But now this, this ability has been out for a while. You know, television, I mentioned the sermon. Right. Uh, the television preachers actually started back in the 1950s. But this is different because now... You can hear your church, your pastor, the people who lead you in music, the people who teach your children, you know, you can see them and be a part of that. And you can also know that most of the people in your church are gathered with you at that particular time. So I think that's good for now. But I think from the biblical model, it's better for us to meet together. And you think about what is a church. The Bible says the church in Ephesians... The, the church is, a, is not only a body of gathered out people, it's a body of gifted people. Hmm. Everybody okay. has spiritual gifts, and the spiritual gifts are, gift, are given to us so that we can build up each other. And I go back to what you were saying from the Hebrews passage, which I actually use in the message. That passage tells us why we should come together to encourage, to stimulate, to, to, to exhort one another. And so it's, it's important, and maybe people... Maybe this will be a time that will help us to understand. And, and you know, the old song goes, uh, you don't know what you had till, till it's gone. Right. Well, maybe this will make us know what we had was more special than maybe what we thought it was. Okay. Pastor Dave. I would, especially that last point, I think you get that. Because you come every Sunday and you're with people and you think, well, this is it. And a lot of times we take it for granted and even mm. skip it. <laughs> Right. You know, for this thing or that. And now we can't get together. We can't see those faces close, you know, and be have that presence with everybody. And hopefully that is a loss. You know, you hope that the people are longing to be back together, to be that fellowship. It's just a just the reality as Kenny was preaching as you look at it, you can't replace the reality and the real sense of love and, and the unity and all when you're face to face in the physical presence of you can't get that through the screen the same and could, could I just jump yes, on sir. Just one thing there yes sir just in another conversation that I had with you but how would it be if marriage were like that how could you do a marriage just through internet I mean that would be somewhat difficult sometimes people have to do that military people you know you, you you can use skype and all of these things but that's no real substitute for being together no that is not uh, i've been separated uh, that Ms. family ben, thing uh, yeah. for five years right oh my uh, on, on military and school and that is no way to run a marriage <laughs> right <laughs> uh, but uh, some of our friends would go we know the secret of your happy marriage mike is never home <laughs> you know that kind of thing uh, <laughs> We're, I was a youth minister a long time ago, long time ago, when they first came out with uh, Meet Me at the Pole. Do you, do you oh, remember yes. that when yeah. it first came out? shows my age. Uh, and I had a large youth group, and one of the things that they talked about was with Meet Me at the Pole was that all the Christians gathered around that flagpole. And for the first time, most of my students connected with other churches in the greater San Antonio area, and they realized, oh, you're a Christian. I right. have a connection now, and, and, and it grows. Uh, what have you sensed from your young people after two weeks of, uh, can we say, confinement, <laughs> if we can say it that <laughs> Isolation way? Isolation. Isolation. <laughs> yeah. It was, and part of the humor, you know, picking on kids, like I was wishing them a happy spring break, you know, oh, this week, because yes. <laughs> this is their spring break now, technically, uh -huh. but <laughs> it's at home. <laughs> they're just glad they're not doing online internet classes. <laughs> yes. But and, and I've mentioned this before, but it was interesting, especially the first time we had just a prayer time, sharing and prayer, that was on a Sunday night, 
every one of them prayed and was just thanking God that they could get together online that night and mm-hmm. talk with each other and see each other. So, the, you know, they're wanting that togetherness and getting better with their video cameras so they can actually see each other and, you know, and, and enjoying that. Saturday, we just did a, an online hangout, played some games and just hung out. And, and typically right now, every time we get together, we go about an hour and a half of whatever we're doing because there's just a lot of talking and sharing and sort of trying to have that connection as much as possible. But also, it has been interesting because we have some youth, you know, from different churches. They'll join with us on certain things and come. And I've met a new one. Uh, Robin is here, so she knows her daughter. But we have a friend joining us from Delaware uh, who was a friend of a couple of our youth. And so she's logging in online and joined in, you know, the last couple of things with our Zoom room. They Mm -hmm. sent the link to her. And so they're sharing that with others to come and be a part of what we're doing. Making a virtual connection. Yes, making a virtual connection. (laughs) Pastor. One of the questions, Pastor King, one of the questions was, what is the difference between a virtual church and an underground church? Would you address that? Yes. A virtual church is a church that is, is meeting through the medium of Facebook or YouTube or some social media like that. Underground church is a church that's, that's persecuted, and so they have to go into hiding, essentially. Virtual church is, is scattered. Underground church is together because wherever they're meeting, you just think about this, they, they love each other so much and they see the value of being together so much that they risk their lives and their livelihoods to be together. Mm-hmm. That's a, that's a huge difference. It, is. it really is. Wow. Pastor Dave, can you add a little bit to that? Well, you get the obvious, the connections, but I do agree just with Kenny. It's that commitment, that commitment to the body, to one another, is okay. so much stronger. Okay. It's, it's not a matter of convenience. <laughs> in fact, it's in spite of, you know, inconvenience is a big thing there. But it's that value system of, you know, this is so important, more important than all these other things. And a lot of times when we're virtual church, and this is the first time we're really, you know, having to do it, forced, but others who, well, I don't feel like going into church, so I'll watch somebody on TV, or I'll, you know, turn this on the Internet or something. We do it as a matter of convenience to avoid the church. Right, matter of convenience. Yep. I... a question uh, with a statement. Uh, the question is, uh, what are some of the things that we do here on Saturday to make sure that it's a good presentation to the church in virtual? Pastor Kenny. Well, we've, we've put together a team. What we, I guess you'd call it a production team. And I present to the team content every week just, just to, to make sure, because I'm, this is a new medium for me, right. to make sure that I'm communicating the idea as well, because I realize there's, there's more than just our people watching this. Uh, on, a, on a regular Sunday morning, I preach 40 or 45-minute sermon. Well, not everybody's used to that. Not everybody's going to stay engaged with that, especially when they're watching it on a small screen. Right. So I've, I've, I've gotten people to help to kind of steer us in the right direction, to, to, to line things up right, to, to, to get things right. And frankly, we're still working on a few things. We've got oh. some new equipment coming this week that we hope is going to help. But uh, it's just been a crash course for us. Okay. And uh, so uh, without the help of the, the folks who have been helping to kind of give immediate feedback as well, I, don't, I, I couldn't have just got my cell phone and done this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Pastor Dave? And, you know, having all the different people, you get the different perspectives. Right. You know, especially of how it's being received. Right. Right. That's the key because there's a lot of people out there. And, and it's very different. I mean... I teach 
Praise Factory with our older kids most Sunday mornings. I'm right there with all the kids, you know, a few feet away. I can teach. They can ask questions. I can interact. You know, so I know what they're thinking mm -hmm. <laughs> because they tell me. Right. <laughs> they're real good with that. And you can help them understand and teach because you have that interaction. Whereas now you're trying to present something and there's no immediate feedback in mm -hmm. terms of and all you know the congregation right if he's preaching and, and none of us class. in here are sixth grader below so <laughs> yeah. i mean i was thinking we must have some pretty intelligent sixth graders the, we have yeah. some sharp six yeah we have do. some sharp, sharp <laughs> so, it, so it really is kind of an odd feeling oh yeah presenting <laughs> to yeah. virtual absolutely because i know when i'm preaching i can look out and read the body language of people i mean you know right. someone's yeah. doing this <laughs> and writing a list it's usually their grocery it's not the top <laughs> 10 things they want yeah. and, and and also uh, when i was a young pastor i had a, a church member who every sunday met me at the back and would say you know that text in luke you know, uh, Pastor, I don't think I would have interpreted it that way. And as a young pastor, that just sent me off the roof, you know. And, and, and this is what you want. You, yeah. you, you, you're, you're in a new area and you want feedback and you, you can't see your congregation and how they're responding. Uh, so, you're, so you're taking the critique of, of people that come and try to give you their best opinion, uh, but the gospel still airs yeah so and, go ahead. And, and i really depend on the on our facebook team the social media team right. you know I, i'll text them and say how how's it going you know because i, I mean i really want to get the feedback i and i don't want just oh that was good like when people walk out the door you <laughs> yeah. know enjoy that today sermon, pastor. Pastor. Great <laughs> sermon. it really yeah. thrilled my i would soul. really like to know yes. if you tell me what you think, think. Then, then we can help you more and right. it's really true, especially, yeah. you know, you encourage them on Facebook, respond. Right. Especially respond right after you watch it, because right. that's exactly. when you're thinking of things. Because exactly. all we're doing is staring at a camera, <laughs> for the most part here. That's exactly right. Now, why I mention that is because I want to go to the next step in this. Okay. How would you help people who are viewing this at home to get a better experience. I, I, I think I emailed you uh, a, a statement that I was taught worship was a verb instead of a noun. That's a great point. It, it's, mm -hmm. it's action, it's participation. So as, as you are looking at your congregation, uh, both of you, uh, from the people you minister to, how do you encourage them to get the most out of this virtual thing that we'll probably be doing for what the next four four or yeah, five weeks probably so how, how would you what are some things that you would recommend pastor i'm gonna start with you i'm so glad you asked that because david and i were talking about it on the phone last <laughs> night were. okay worship is a verb right uh the, the the thing that bothers me one of the things that bothers me about virtual is you become a spectator hmm. you're you're a consumer Worship is not being a consumer. So how do I make it a verb? How do I go from seeing myself as the recipient of good teaching or, or an interesting panel discussion, and a lot of people really like the panel discussion uh, from the uh, Facebook page. I, I would say, first of all, remember that God is the audience. God is the ultimate audience, and I think we have to remember that even here. God is the audience. How can I most engage my gifts and my thoughts to, to honoring him in a way as I worship that will translate to honoring him as I live my life? So I, I think that being engaged, and one of the things that w the, the, the social media group did is they put the outline up before the sermon about 15 minutes ahead of time. Okay, You can study that. Uh, we, we send out the title. I would say read the scriptures. Uh, we've added the music now. Sing the song. Sing the song with, with Phil. And just remember that, that you're not there just to spectate, but you're there to be involved and to be engaged. Okay. Pastor, Pastor Dick. I love words. <clears throat> so when you think of worship, you know, and break it back and go back through it, you know, the history there is it's worth-ship originally. And so when we think of worship, and we have to translate that into the home, 
what is our God worthy of from me? You know, what is he worth? <laughs> A buzz on my phone there. <laughs> but so in the music, is God worthy of my voice? Of me lifting up his praise through my voice? Not just in my head, <laughs> you know, but even, and that's true here too, you know, to sing, you know, is when it, his word is being, you know, read or taught, is he worthy of my attention, of my mind, focusing on his word, wanting to learn and understand from him. When we're praying, is he worthy of me joining in prayer with it? And that's one thing, even though we're virtual, when one person is leading in prayer, everybody can join in with it. Pray in agreement with them, and as the Spirit leads you, add things into that prayer in your mind and heart and all to that. So we can join in the prayer, we can join in the singing, we can listen, knowing that we're within the body here in this teaching. But everything is I'm giving this to God. I'm giving my voice, I'm giving my heart, I'm giving my mind, everything to God, because He is worthy of all I've got and more. I think it's a reflection of that greatest commandment where we love him with all our heart, soul, mind, and Luke adds strength with that. We give it all, and that's worship. Okay, good, thank you. Now, talking about the sermon a little bit, uh, we were in Revelation chapter one. The emphasis was on 13 through 20. Uh, I, I wanna ask you some questions. All right. Well, what was your favorite part? My favorite part was, was knowing the setting, that he's there alone on a rugged island, most likely hearing the, the waves crashing against the shore. And then as he sits there thinking he's alone, he really is in the spirit, and the Lord appears. Mm. He's not alone. The Lord is with him. In... In pneumaticos, in the spirit, on the Lord's day, that that is just it just inspires me. But it goes well with what we're now at home. For some people, I am alone. That's true. But I have never been lonely because, in the spirit, or the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit who dwells in me is probably what part of. Exactly. Where I'm at. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's a great that's a great picture it is. That, that you preach Sunday. Yeah. That's oh, I, I, I like that. Pastor Dave, what was your... what was amazing to me is when Jesus appears and he speaks and John first sees him, he falls, says as if dead. <laughs> you think of him being he's an old man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you wonder. And, and Kenny brought this out how He's there dead, and then Jesus touches him and raises him back up. But after that, he's in the presence of Christ, but able to just enjoy the presence of Christ. To me, it's an interesting transition yeah. from just the stark fear, overwhelming of the glory of God. Right. <laughs> you know, you think of all the different times through the Bible when angels appear or Christ appears, you know, just people overwhelmed by the glory of God. But God enables John to come back up and sit and talk with him and be with him in a very special way, intimate way of being right in the very presence of God. Oh, that's awesome. I, I have three, th three parts that I really like about your scripture and, and about your present, uh, presentation of the gospel. Uh, number one, what you're talking about, uh, but from a little bit different uh, I, I take that the writer of Revelation is John the Apostle, mm -hmm. and uh, I remember the intimacy between John and Jesus. Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is uh, the, 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 the one he loved. Yeah. This is the one that got a little extra from the others, <laughs> right. you know? Yeah. Tell me a little extra about this. Yeah. And John writes his purpose and everything like that. But what's amazing is, is when he sees the glory of who Jesus is in that moment. He had that intimacy with Jesus while on earth, but in that moment, he is like Exodus 33, 18, and, and 20. Uh, you, you cannot see the glory, the Shekinah glory of God, except you, what, die? Yeah. And then just as soon as he sees it, he, he does what? Uh, he doesn't take advantage of the intimacy. He, he, 
he drops in holy reverence. He does. Uh, as if he's dead. I love that part. That, right. that's, a, that's, a, that's a great part. And the other part is the holding of the seven churches. Jesus, yeah. Yes. Now, I want to ask you a question, Pastor. Does your Lord hold your church? That's a great question, isn't it? I believe that he does. All right, take off on it, Pastor. I, you know, I know this church, and one of the questions that, that Eric was, uh, he texted me was, you know, how, how important is it to be a part of a church? Now, here for us, because we have so many military people, membership per se is not the, the, the big all, all end all and all that, but being a part of the church is. Because this isn't my church, David's church. Sometimes people say, your church. No, not my church. It's Christ's church, and I really believe that here. I believe that it's Christ-centered, and I, I really believe, Mike, that God, th that Christ himself holds this church up, and he holds many churches up, for sure, right. but, but a church that, that loves him and loves his word, and this church truly loves his word, and... Uh, I do believe that. I believe that that there's a, a real special sense of that here. Okay. Pastor Dave, you want to follow up on that? Well, I think so. And just thinking, like with the question, all the importance of membership, I think one thing we miss so much, and that's the joy of being a part of the ministry of Christ. Yeah. And understand that goes along with that thought that this is Christ's church. And, you know, every person is a part of the body, an important part of the body, yeah. has the gifts and the roles to be a part of the body. And there is great joy in glorifying God and sharing Christ through loving and serving, you know, in all these different ways with others. It, you know, we think of the old saying, when I do that, it's, it's more fun to give than to receive. You think of the joy of giving. Right. There is that true joy of serving and giving Christ and sharing Christ with others, Absolutely. of loving others, being a part of that body and doing for others. It's a joy that you don't get just coming and being here and then leaving. Right. But it's when you're committed to the body and you're giving of the gifts that God has given to you, and you're giving as a member of the family. Okay. All right, thank you. Pastor Kenny. You, you, you mentioned a few minutes ago uh, the different members of the body mm -hmm. and the different gifts. Uh, how, in the virtual world, as we're experiencing uh, the last two weeks and probably the next three or four weeks, can those different pieces of the body encourage one another and build one up in virtual time? I, th I think it's going to have to be right now through technology. They're going to have to call each other. Uh, the, the, the groups that, like, you know, one of the things that's happening with, like, with the, the social media team, they're really getting to do a lot of work right now, and I know they're really enjoying that because they, they know that their ministry is it's really a cutting-edge ministry right now, and it's doing a lot of good, and the, and the sound people and all of that, too. Everybody else doesn't get to, to do this. I mean, I, I'm just sitting here thinking about the whole time how much fun we're having and how great this is. Uh, and, and it's great to share our gifts with you guys. But I think it's going to have to be through calling each other, uh, for, for like groups like deacons, interacting with their families, uh, for the elders, maybe calling and encouraging each other and asking questions of each other and say, well, you know, what can we do to, to maybe help the staff make this better through this time? And, and, uh, and then for... For all the other people who are gifted and encouraging and all that, I think just call and check on people and and just maybe send an email or whatever. I mean, that's right now without physical contact is pretty tough. Yeah. Okay. Pastor Pete. And part, and we mentioned before, it's the Facebook. Comment on Facebook. Yeah. And so people see and hearing from you, not audibly, but, you know, through the messages that you're leaving on Facebook. So comment on the different things. Put questions there. Put, you know, things that stood out to you, whether in the sermon or the panel discussions or lessons, whatever's going on. You know, respond there so that you have that virtual conversation with a bunch of people. Because okay. a bunch of people get to see that. That's a good well. answer. 
<laughs> but it is interesting because uh -huh. uh, you know uh -huh. former youth workers that you know loved and had in our church they're in montana now and they've been commenting on facebook watching the well, sermons that's encouraging and stuff. Isn't it? it is so oh, that is. Yeah. we're probably reaching a lot of people right now that we we don't normally reach and that's why we got to in in the balance of things we have to think about once we start meeting back, well, how do we incorporate some of this into the future? Oh, we were going to go there. Okay. I'm going to hold you to that just <laughs> right. a, a second. Uh, I want to ask a question, and I want to phrase it in a way. Uh, what are your pastoral concerns at this time, being virtual and having limited contact with the body? What are your pastoral concerns? Well, your heart breaks because if somebody goes to the hospital, you can't go see them. Okay. I mean, if, if, you, if, if, if you took your mother to the hospital right now, to the emergency room, they would say, you drop her off at the door and you wait in the parking lot. That's, I mean, I'm hearing people say that okay. as I'm talking to them on the phone. So just, just knowing that something can happen and you can't be there uh, is tough. Uh, just, just not having the feedback and being able to encourage people. Okay. You know, I, I think that's the biggest thing. I really do. Okay. And I, I certainly miss them out here. Okay. I do. All right. Pastor Lee. It's, I guess the, the intimacy is limited. Okay. Especially getting to know people and I guess to go deeper in conversations. It's, it's a very different thing for me to be back in the youth room and have some teenagers come in and let's start a conversation and then things and you can kind of read some things from them and you know an hour and a half later you well we got to get out of here you know that kind of thing versus you see maybe a picture on a screen and you can hear them some but you just you Not can't read a full the full picture same. right you can't really know uh -huh. know them in the same way you know it's not as an intimate connection really so you're you're reaching out to them and you want them to have but in the same way their connection with each other is limited you just don't get that close intimate time and okay. there's something special again we we talked earlier we take it for granted so much but there's something special about just being face to face and the physical presence with somebody right you said in your sermon pastor the beginning part i wrote it down on a note uh, 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 it's how I stay involved in your sermon. Uh, you said something about being cautious about the virtual world. Cautious about the virtual world. Uh, and you mentioned a couple of things, uh, balancing God, uh, government guidance, and, and, there, and, and those kinds of things. But that stood out for me when you said to your congregation, be ca cautious about the virtual world. Expound on that, would you? I, I think people are allowing the virtual world to, to keep them away from a lot of contact with people, face-to-face -face contact. I think that people are, and it's very easy to do this, we get lazy in thinking about things. We let the virtual world think for us. And I think, I think it's important to, to sometimes physically read something, to physically listen to something so that your mind engages. I, I think that the medium itself, and when I say the medium itself, I mean pixels and sounds and all the lights flashing at you. These things interact with your brain. There's a physiological aspect of this as well. I think it's good for us to, to balance all of that that light and sound with, with introspection and conversation. Ms. Beth said something to me uh, yesterday morning. She said, this new stuff is very addictive. Yeah, yeah, because it's easier. For one thing, we like easy and convenient, and there's so much coming at you at one time. You just feel like you can do a lot. You know what I mean? Right. And, uh, I mean, I, I love YouTube. I love listening to 70s music and working at the same time and all that kind of stuff. You know, I love that. But, but you know, 
there's a time when you need to say, let me really think about now what's happening to me and be balanced in, in my life and in my, especially my thought life. You gave us uh, a book a couple of Wednesday nights ago when we were actually meeting, and it was called The Death of Expertise, I believe. Mm -hmm. I'm reading them, the last 10 or 12 pages left. And one of the thought, thoughts in that was to be cautious of the virtual world because it, it causes you not to think, it cause, and if you do think, you think in herd. I, I believe this with this these people and it, it, it mentioned the fact that you could get lost in it and instead of dialoguing with people you end up arguing with people yeah and it's like this I mean I had heart surgery back in August well I'm sure on YouTube and on Wikipedia I could look up all this stuff and I could think that I knew as much as that heart doctor knows uh -huh. but I don't think I really do I, I think there's a danger there, and that's where the ex death of expertise comes in. And I also think there's a danger for people just to get wrapped up in, in these outlandish conspiracy things and all this. I mean, do I believe there are conspiracies? Yes, but I don't believe everything's a conspiracy. You know, I, I, think, it, I think you really got to think about these things. Okay, so virtual church is not forever, is it? I hope not. I, I, I hope that through the virtual world, church can can maybe be better more effective and maybe megan can speak to that in a moment mm -hmm. but the virtual world is not a replacement for the gathered people of god i agree with you pastor yeah. there's something about the gathering the stimulus yeah. that hebrews talks about i, I think there's some things that uh, what uh, you brought up to acts chapter 2 in your part of of uh, the children's sermon uh, especially that that part of what uh, the apostles teaching mm -hmm. fellowship the breaking of bread uh, yeah. and prayer uh, and and the intimacy that prayer brings about I mean you're sharing with who Abba father exactly the, the needs of your people I, I know as a chaplain I get in trouble sometimes <laughs> because when you ask me to pray for you uh, it's not a cliche for me Right. If you ask me to pray, wherever we're at, I'm going to look at you and go, let's pray. And I'm going to put my hand on you, and we're going to go before the Heavenly Father because that is an intimacy that we have. It's a, I think it, I would even say a Christian right Absolutely. to go before my Heavenly Father and petition Come for boldly. another brother, yeah. another sister. Uh, I... I like it when the church gathers to I pray. Mm -hmm. I think there's power. What do you think in that, Pastor? I, I think you're absolutely right to, to, to hear each other pray. And, and you, you can't do that virtually. I mean, you can enjoy a lot of things, but you cannot be in a room and sense the unction Ooh. of prayer or even preaching. I mean, you have to be there. Now, again, I, I'm not going to undersell under uh, the virtual world. I know it's powerful. I know that television is a powerful medium because look what it makes people do. Right. I mean, advertisers know it's a powerful medium. I understand that. You'll be buying toilet paper left and right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So I'm just telling you, it's not a substitute, though, for the real thing. And we like, and this is what Satan does, and this is what scares me. Satan is in the substitute business he if you read the book of revelation okay you have the holy trinity he has the unholy trinity the beast mm -hmm. the false prophet the dragon okay yeah he he wants to substitute for the real thing he's a counterfeiter that's what he is yes. he's a counterfeiter because if he can you know his his big business is not you know just dr getting people in the gutter his big business is getting people thinking these ideas for truth when they're not because he wants he, he's the father of lies so I, I think that is a real danger and why you can't substitute one for the other and, and I, the best example that I don't know why it didn't stick out to me when he said it but when you said it it just 
hit me. You can't have communion in the virtual world. How important is communion? Yeah. You know? And you think, you know, we're talking about the virtual world. You miss that body sense because in the virtual world, the caution that he's talking about, it's all about you. It's so addicting because I'm in control. Yeah. And it's whether I want to virtually make myself somebody different, present myself in some way that's not real, you know, but looks good. Or if I'm just honest with it, you know, not trying to, you know, change myself in that way, but I control what I watch. I control when I watch. If I like this, I watch it. If I don't like it, so it's all me. I, it becomes me centered of what I want and what I like. And when you come into the body, we gather together. There's God is the audience, and it's all about what he wants, what he, you know, is worthy of. Not, well, I like this and don't like that, because you don't have a body if everybody's that way. <laughs> They're all wanting their music or their thing or this type sermon or whatever, you know. Okay. Coming as the body is denying that self for the sake of Christ, the glory of Christ. Before we introduce Megan into this, yes. this, this talk time, I, I, one illustration, and I want you to comment on it. All right. Oh, a young preacher had an older church member that was upset with him and decided, I'm not coming to church anymore because you, you, the pastor. Young, young pastor for weeks didn't know what to say to the older man, had no clue what to say, but he realized after three or four weeks he, he needed to do something. He's part of the body, right? Yep. So he goes and visits the old man in his home. And as they're sitting there, not saying very much, the young pastor's scared and the older man is intimidating. They're looking at the fire. And all of a sudden the young pastor reaches up, takes uh, the forks and takes a coal and moves it off to the side and sits back down. After about five minutes, you, you know what happens to that coal. That's cool. It moves from that red glow to that darkness. And then all of a sudden, the older man steps up, picks up the coal and puts it back on the fire and says, I will see you Sunday. Wow. And he leaves. Pastor, with that illustration about the church, church and its need to gather and to be part of the body of Christ, how do you how do you talk to your family, your 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 church, in uh, giving them hope that in a couple of weeks we'll move the coal? Absolutely, I, that's a wonderful illustration. I've been pastoring for a long time. I've not heard that. That's a very good illustration, I, and I hope that you know right now the fire is kind of scattered, the coals are scattered, but because. Every coal is indwelled by the Spirit. We can come back together, and it'll, the fire will burn again. Well, thank you, Pastor. Yes, Appreciate sir. it. Yes, sir. I'm going to invite Megan in, if you don't mind, Pastor. That'll be fine. Miss Brown, it's good hey. to have, it's good to have you part of the group, and we're talking with you on. Parachurch. Tell me what you do for a brief second or two. I've seen you here on Wednesday nights. We've had some discussion. You've looked across the aisle and gone, I wonder if he really believes that. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am so excited to be here. I have loved listening to the panel, and it has just been so encouraging to be here with you guys and, and to listen and just kind of sit at your feet and just hear all the great things that you have to say. Um, my name is Megan. I am a military missionary. And basically what that means is my husband and I look at this active duty lifestyle as a way to perpetually live on mission. We are moved every two to four years by the U.S. government and wherever we land is the new mission field. Um, we don't have to raise funds or uh, do a lot of work to get prepared for what we do. We live on base to be geographically accessible by those we are trying to reach. Um, the military at large is very unchurched, specifically in millennial and Gen Z generations. Um, they are kind of falling off to the side. Um, they don't have a biblical framework. They have a very secular perspective. And so what we do is we use tools like intimate home Bible studies, community groups, um, community events, 
to bring them into the family of God and then systematically filter them into a local church. So that's, that's what I do. We kind of come alongside the local church, we become members of the local church, and then we filter in those that are far away from the Lord into the covenant family of the Lord so that they can experience the means of grace, that they can be present and plugged in in a living, breathing body. Um, and we're seeing pockets of revival happening all over the country alongside military bases. Um, we get excited about churches like Bonaire because you're five minutes door to door from, from Air Force families. Um, and I think if we really believe that Acts 17, that we are established and our boundaries are set by the Lord, uh, that if we were in a college town or an urban setting, we would have amazing college ministries or urban, urban meet the needs of people that live in urban areas. Um, and, and here we're three miles up the road from an Air Force base. And I think that that gives us um, an exciting opportunity to reach those at Robinson Abroad. Okay. Megan, let me ask you some questions, if, if, if possible, yeah. just uh, some discussion questions. Uh, do you see parachurch working away from the church uh, or do you see it in a partnership? How do you, how do yeah. you view that? You so this week I had an amazing opportunity to be on an FCMM virtual call, which is the Fellowship of Christian Military Ministries. Okay. Uh, crew Military was there, the Navigators, all of these amazing Family Life, Reboot Combat Ministries, um, some amazing military resources all came together. And the theme was partnership. And I think it's important to understand uh, that the parachurch ministry exists to serve the local church and not to replace the local church. Okay. And so many times I've worked with so many different parachurch ministries um, that wanted to almost replace the biblical feeding, the biblical teaching outside of the local church, take it onto a different platform or a big stage or mountaintop events. Um, but what I believe is that the parachurch ministry exists to serve the local church and the local chaplain corps. Um, it's our job to come alongside um, and stand in the gap for places uh, that may not be as well resourced. I mean, I, we know that the chaplains across the country are undermanned. They don't have the resources they need, the volunteers that they need to reach everyone that they are supposed to reach. Um, I had an, on, an, on an awesome conversation with another chaplain where we talked about, imagine if you were in a city of 30,000 people and there's one church and three pastors, could you ever imagine being able to meet the needs? Um, so parachurch is very helpful and handy when they understand the, the, the reason they exist, the partnership between ministries. Okay, how do you make the connection between uh, the military base and Pastor Dave? who is yeah. a youth and, uh, I'm gonna say, youth and young adult minister for this church. How do, you, how do you make that connection between the two? So I think really you gotta back, you gotta back up a little bit to the why we make the connection. Okay. And so um, I look at the missional capabilities of the U.S. Armed Forces. Um, if you want the gospel to travel quickly and all over the world, the military is the way to do it. If we could think about an equipped military ready to be ambassadors for Christ, prepared, trained up within the local church as ambassadors for Christ. If we want the gospel to go to the Middle East, we have men there. If you want it to go to the middle of oceans, we got, we got folks out there too. Mm -hmm. If you want it in all 50 states, there are military members and their families that could be equipped to carry this message to the four corners. And I think the local church plays a paramount part um, in accomplishing that mission. Um, what's happening today is that military members are slipping in and out of the backs of local churches. Um, they're not plugged in, they're not trained, they're not discipled, they aren't part of community groups. And so what happens is that they struggle through finding faith. And, and so the reason that I think it's so important to connect military families to a Pastor Dave or a Pastor Kenny or a Robin or an Amanda Talbert in the military community inside of the church is because it takes that living, breathing relationship with the local body to live this life well as a Christian. Okay. You mentioned a word that I, I thought was very interesting. Uh, you said slipping out. Yeah. Uh, what does that mean, slipping out? So these are the stories that I get from the ground. I, I lead women all over the country to open their homes and teach Bible studies um, to, to create biblical community. 
And the stories that I get back are, I've been to this church four times and they keep recognizing me as a guest. <laughs> um, they don't remember my name. Um, I've been turned away to serve because I'm only gonna be here for six months and it wouldn't be worth training me. Um, I don't know anyone there. We've gone eight times, no one will speak okay. to me. So, they're, so that, they're sneaking. In church yeah. growth, that's called the touch of seven. Yes. If you, if you know seven people in a church, you're most likely going to stay in that church. Yes. Uh, but what you're talking about is not just staying. Mm -hmm. You're talking about investing in that church. Yes. And you're talking about spiritual growth. So what are you looking for in a church body uh, so that you can go, you know, Airman Snuffy or Soldier Snuffy or Sailor Snuffy, if I connect him to this church, he will, she will get, how, what do you look for? Oh yeah, I love this question. So I have a checklist in my mind when we are looking for a local church. Um, essentially we look for four things. Uh, the first is a Bible believing teaching church that goes verse by verse, books of the Bible. It's very important to us that expository preaching is important to, to the church because we believe that expository teaching equips members of the local church to come to the text themselves. Um, one of the articles that I read this week was fascinating. It was saying, um, it was a warning from European churches. North America, get ready. You're about to find out if your members can read the text. You're about to find out. So what we're finding out is that local churches sometimes miss the mark on teaching their congregations how to approach the text with confidence so that in epidemics like this, they're not solely reliant on someone to spoon feed them with a silver spoon the message of the gospel. They know it, it's ingrained because they've been equipped to go anywhere in the Bible and find Jesus, which is a big deal. So that's, that's number one. Uh, the number two is the dedication to worship. Um, again, back to worship. What is God worthy of? What are we singing? Are we singing things about ourselves? It's about me, we... Jesus. Yes. It's all about you know, me, Is Jesus. it about Jesus being our cheerleader or is it about us submitting over to his lordship and, okay. and saying and proclaiming what we believe as a body to be true about our father? Um, that's a big one. Um, we look for community. Community is the lifeblood of a church. And if you ask any community member from the military what they want, that is number one. We need community. They want instant community. Instant, yes. plug and play, uh, plug and community. Play. Yes. Hi, my name is Megan. What are you doing for Thanksgiving? I just got here, right? Like it is <laughs> instant. instant and intimate and vulnerable and honest and, and authentic. I mean, those authentic relationships are what should drive community. Um, and last, it's, it's a missional outlook. Uh, we look for churches that, that love the call to send people. It is so much more than about um, loving and caring for our people. And yes, we want to do that. We want to love and care for our people. You know, Crew Military has a, has a, has a uh, tagline that I love, win, build, send. That is what the church should do. And, and when you guys were talking about, you know, coming together and, and, and what that really looks like as the church. Um, we need to remember that virtually we're coming together to do what? To be sent back out. So as, we are, as we're coming together virtually and we're watching these simulcast style worship services, we can't forget that the end result of that is to be sent back out. This is one of the greatest opportunities for evangelism that we've got. Uh, I pastored a church in New, New Jersey during the, the, the dying days of the 80s and 90s where companies didn't rotate them back and forth any longer. Mm -hmm. I, and uh, my church struggled with losing members. Mm -hmm. And I had to change that. And I had to tell them, hey, we're not just losing a member. We're sending you from New Jersey, from this experience to another experience. And you need to tell them about what you experienced in New Jersey, that body of believers in New Jersey. Absolutely. And you should not be afraid of that. That's one of the things that you're looking for in a yes. church that says, we know you're only gonna be here for 18 to 24 months, and we wanna use you, bless you, and send you. Amen. Amen. Yes. yes. All right, Pastor Dave, do you have any questions you wanna ask Megan? Well, I was just <clears throat> thinking that is the <clears throat> Excuse me. The hard part 
but the neat part, and we've had a lot here, and hopefully do even better, <clears throat> because they're only here a short time. Mm -hmm. So to use them, you had to get to know them quick, <clears throat> and want to get to know them quick, and then want them to be truly that part of the body, that part of the body. So just uh, one question would be, <clears throat> what is the most effective way to, to grab them, <laughs> yeah. in a sense, when yeah. they come in? So I think that there's a couple things, and and you know we've been we've been visiting this church on and off for about a year now. Uh, we we love it here. People are hospitable. People are welcoming. Welcoming. Um, you know, I I heard about this church initially because one of the women that attends this church landed in my living room Bible study. So the way that we essentially do mission is we set up a, a home Bible study and we use it as a filter or a funnel to bring people into the local church. Women are more likely to hear the gospel at my kitchen table than they are to join me for a Sunday service before they know me or they know what we're about. And so um, Amanda Talbert joined our Bible study and was such an amazing voice in, in building community outside of the church. And then we started trickling in as a group. And so I, I think one of the things to do is to be on the lookout. You see groups of people coming in together. What do their families look like? What are their needs? speaking to them and then this is the key invite them out to lunch D say hey i would love to take you to lunch to find out what you thought about the sermon or would you guys like to come to our community group we have child care we've got pizzas we would love to get to know you and i think that just invitation that honest invitation into the life of the church really is the difference between life and death for military families um and and simultaneously you know i just got done with a with a seven month deployment Thank the Lord, my husband didn't get delayed and he came home on time. Thank you. Um, but it was one of those really rough seasons where we really didn't feel like we had the resources here yet. We, we were relatively new. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's about keeping your finger on the pulse of what military families are actually experiencing and being willing to tailor your expectations of what they can do or what they can participate in with the struggles that they're currently facing. But I, I think that's it. We were talking a little bit about reaching out to this younger population. A couple of things. Uh, the, uh, 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 they know scripture, but they don't know doctrine. Uh, and I, I mean, they'll quote you some scripture, but they don't know the doctrine behind all that. Uh, they want their autonomy. They don't want to be told anything. So how do we reach out and pull that group in and have them connected? From your point of view, I realize yeah. it's your point of view. Go ahead. So uh, I know I look 12. I'm 30. I'm almost 35. I look um, 15. I, yeah. <laughs> so I, I'm I'm on the edge of the millennial generation. Right. And so, um, but the but the edge that still grew up playing Oregon Trail and learned how to do computers with DOS key commands. Like I'm, I'm you know, we're 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 right there on the line. You remember 13 megahertz? I do. Yeah. I do. I remember when we first got internet and you had to dial on and then I'd go walk the dog, do the dishes, and then come back and I'd be online. So um, it's, it's um, I, I would almost say that that has not been my experience in that people know some of the scriptures but don't know the doctrine behind it. The, the experience that I've had on the ground is that not only do they not know the scriptures, they have no framework for biblical understanding at all. And so um, a majority of the women that I, that I end up working with um, have been raised completely outside of the church and, and even the ones that have been raised in the church they know Old Testament Bible stories. This guy got a haircut one time and then all of a sudden his Popeye muscles disappeared. Like they have these really twisted versions of kids' bedtime stories, but they don't know how the Old Testament connects with the new. What does it mean to believe in Christ? What does it mean to be a biblical woman? What does it look like to walk out what you believe? What is orthodoxy and orthopraxy? What are those things? Why does theology matter? They don't even know these words. And it's so, a strange language. yeah, it's a complete different language. And so when I begin to teach the first six sessions of Bible study with me is, is deconstructing all of their bad theology. <laughs> this is probably what you believed. And this is where you missed the mark. This is what we actually believe. This is how we walk this out. Let's deal with some of the harder things. My favorite question to ask is what's that scripture that you wrestle with? The one you don't like. For me, judges is pretty hard. <laughs> um, you know, what does it look like to grapple with the text? 
Um, you know, a friend of mine says it this way, God's chest is big enough to where we can beat on it a little bit sometimes. It's big enough. And so let's bring these doubts and these struggles and let's struggle through the text together. And so they, they give me all these answers. Well, I don't know, why does God say I can't do this? Or why does he say I only have to do this? Mm -hmm. And we, we get down to a very practical level. So I, I would say that my experience is that they want someone with authority. But here's the difference. I think it takes empathy, authenticity, and authority. I think that what they've experienced is just authority. And, and our whole generation has been completely against it. Like, no, you ain't gonna tell me my business. I'm gonna do what I want. I don't need to listen, yeah. right? I'm a, yeah, yeah, hey, here I am, full sleeve tattoos, red hair. I mean, yeah, I do what I want. But simultaneously, we are looking for leaders with empathy, authenticity, and authority that can shape us and make us into the people that God wants us to be. One of the most quoted or most known scriptures right up until the 90s was John 3.16. That was the scripture. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Compared to today, the number one scripture. Jeremiah 29. No, Matthew, <laughs> Matthew 7. Yeah. 7. Judge, judge not, not lest ye be judged. Yeah. <clears throat> and that doesn't mean yeah. that you don't examine the fruit of someone's life. Yes. It just means you, you, you look at your own life first and get your mess together before yes. you, yeah. you say something. But we see that turning, and you're right. They do not want to be told. Right. Uh, I pulled up to the gate and was stopped. And uh, just having a conversation with the kid, and he went, uh, well, I was bored, and, and, and I decided to join the Air Force, and this is what I, I'm doing. And just being a good pastor, well, what's your college? Well, I, I got 60 hours in. Well, what would you like to do? I said, well, this is a great time. You should go back and be a nurse. Get your nursing degree. And you could see the cringe on his face yeah. as I was just dialoguing, just conversation. It was like, don't tell me what I should do. Mm -hmm. And I'm, yeah. oh, my. And I got four adult children that can be just like that. I'm like, give me my ID. <laughs> Let's go on. But, think, no, but it, it, it takes a lot to be able to move to witness, yes. to disciple that kind of heart. Yeah. It takes relationship. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I have found is that, that um, those that, that recognize the authority that we carry in the scripture as ministers um, comes from authentic and deep relationships. I can tell a difference in the first week to the seventh week of women that have walked through this journey with me, um, where at the beginning they might have been standoffish, they don't really want to talk about their own sin or their struggles because they're worried about being judged not only by me but by the group. And, and then simultaneously, by the time we've been together for week eight, it is like they're taking their emotional purses and dumping it out on the table and saying, what do we do with this? Precious, can you put a little bit back in yes, the purse? Yes, like, oh, honey, that's hanging out. Put that back. So, so, but part of it is they want that authentic knowing that you love them and that you care about them before you start instructing them. They need to know that they are going to be well-received and cared for, and then they are more than willing to hear what the Bible says about their whatever particular issue and, you know, earlier when you said, you know, the most popular scripture, you know, I, I deal mostly with women. And so Jeremiah 29 is at the top. I mean, it's on journals and it's on cute coffee cups. And, you know, one day I kind of made a sideways joke and I was like, man, how's that Babylonian captivity coming? And they didn't get my joke. They're like, what are you no, talking about? Because I didn't understand, right? <laughs> no wow. idea. And I'm like, that must be tough. <laughs> like, uh, but part of it is that we've, we've made Jesus in, in women's ministry predominantly into this cheerleader that wants us to be our best selves and run our best side hustle and do all these amazing things. A cosmic waiter. And yes, yeah. a cosmic waiter that, that just snaps his finger and all of a sudden we are purpose-filled, driven, bold women. Um, but it's so different when we understand what the actual application of the gospel is. And so, um, yeah, I'm tracking with you. I, I think it's about relationship. And then you can start undoing those, those deep-rooted beliefs. And before I invite the pastor back up, I know he's getting ready to come up and say some closing words to us panel group members. Uh, the hard part is now we live in a hectic world where we struggle to give time to our family, our employee, 
I, I mean, there was a time in our history that we gave uh, six hours or six units of time to the Lord. Sunday morning Bible study, Sunday morning worship, Sunday night worship, Sunday night Bible study, Wednesday night, and Pastor, if you can get one more night, we can do a, a meeting at, we can do that. And now we live in a time where I'm going to give you one unit of time, maybe. Mm -hmm. You make the best of it. How do you see the church developing those intimate relationships? How, we struggle with that. Uh, bringing someone in and investing that much time in them. Talk to me about that a little bit. Pastor, you're going to make your way back. Yeah, I, I think that needs to be modeled. And what I mean by that is, is when we talk about spiritual disciplines, studying the word of the Lord, being in prayer, um, I think that this generation needs more than just to be instructed. They need to see it. They need to see how that plays out. What does biblical marriage look like? I mean, I, I, you know, I think that the way we do discipleship in our country is so weird sometimes. Here, meet me for one hour at this coffee shop, and we're going to teach you everything you need to know. You know, I heard the speaker once talk about it, like he was talking about woodworking. And he said, if we wanted to teach somebody woodworking, you wouldn't meet them at a coffee shop for an hour and talk to them. about. You would get dirty. You would, get, you would be in a workshop together. You would show them. Um, I know that when we disciple people in the military community, we do it from our dinner table. You're going to see a lot more of what I'm like when my kids are throwing mashed potatoes across the table at each other, <laughs> not speaking from personal experience, um, sure. than you would if I am in a coffee shop. You're going to see what the means of grace look like in our home. You're going to see my husband. You're going to see me. You're going to see our kids. We're going to do corporate prayer together. You're going to see those things. And I think that this generation just needs to see them happen. Um, in order for them to be fully immersed in the culture of growing and 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 churches need to be intentional about pairing those Titus two people into their lives. I mean, I, you could ask anybody I know if they have someone in that Titus two role in their lives and almost all will say no. Mm. So so part of it is is just that interaction and relationship. I think it all centers back around community, but I was a community group director and that's why I'm a little biased. <laughs> but it goes back to being real. Yeah. When yeah. they know you're real. Yeah. And then they listen. They do. I do uh, couples enrichment for the military. Uh, and uh, I close after they have a time of forgiveness. I close with this. You do not know how many young people sit in my office and tell me they've never seen a good marriage. And you're like, oh, my soul. They don't have anything to model. It's just a free for all. And it's a sad moment. So I, I, I tell those couples, go home and model the best thing you can for your children and for your neighbor's children. That will make an impact in your community. Megan, thank you. I'm going to ask uh, so Pastor, Pastor Kenny, would you come on in and, and uh, bring us to a conclusion? And probably if you've got a moment to talk about this coming Sunday, Pastor. Thank you, Megan. That was very interesting. I, I just really enjoy the, the, the talk because one of the things that I'm, I, the Lord has blessed me with is always want to be real, just to be authentic. And I like authentic people. And I, I, I really enjoy people. I enjoy conversations with people. And I, I'm loving this. This is something we've got to keep going on even when we get, get back together. We've got to do this on some kind of regular basis and, until we send you off to pastor somewhere else and, <laughs> yeah whatever but anyway I'm not looking forward to that Mike but we'll enjoy the time we have this coming Sunday is Palm Sunday it's upon us my, my wife and I were trimming our palm trees this past Sunday afternoon and that's after the sermon and I'm thinking about I'm thinking about Christ because I told her I said you know if we were meeting at church this week this coming week for Palm Sunday We've got the palm branches right here because we had a lot of them. But anyway, it is Palm Sunday. I'm going to be speaking on the trial of Christ, the trial of Christ. And so I would like to invite everybody to come. And <laughs> I would like to invite everybody to be watching and tell others to be watching this coming Sunday. That's hard to break, isn't it? Come to Facebook and yeah, YouTube. Yeah, come, come to Facebook and YouTube. And <laughs> <laughs> and there you're going to find the message this week, Jesus on trial. And I hope that you will come and be a part of that. And again, thank you, Mike, for 
doing a great job. David, Megan, thank you all. And if you'd like to, let's close in a prayer. Let's do this. Father, we thank you for the time that we've had together today to, to think about your word and to, and to think thoughts about your church. Your church is your bride, and you love your church. And, and Lord, for those of us that you have saved, and especially those of us that you've called into ministry, Lord, truly we love your church too, and we, we love the people of your church who, who comprise the, the, the blocks that make up the church. We love the people because they're your bride. We love them because you love them. And so we just we pray that uh, in the coming weeks ahead that you would keep families in this area safe. We know this disease is still ramping up, and we, we pray that you would just uh, cause this, Lord, to, to begin to abate. And Lord, we pray for the safety of our military. We've talked about our military a great deal today. We pray for their safety. Many of them are on the front line now. And, uh, treating this disease and Lord of helping in communities that need hospitals. We pray for our doctors and nurses and Lord for all those in health care who are on the front line of this uh, fighting this enemy, this enemy virus as well. We pray for your safety upon them and we thank you for them. Lord, we just thank you and your grace that you've provided them. We pray for this church and for all the churches, Lord, who who love you, who are uh, carrying your gospel to this world. We pray for them, and we pray that this coming Sunday, Lord, that you might, Lord, be, just make yourself known in your greatness and, Lord, this great gift that you've given us in Jesus Christ. We pray this in his name. Amen.